happy 4th of July weekend to all of you. I know that uh, last evening in my neighborhood there was uh, a few rocket shows going on. and uh, I do know that uh, somehow, some way, the, the weekend maybe has developed into who has the best fireworks show. I said uh, my son-in-law came in town. He's working on... Uh, working on a little project at the house for me, and, uh, and um, so the kids are here, the grandchildren, and they were asleep last night, and I thought, okay, are they going to make it through the, uh, the pre-show for tonight? <laughs> because, of course, tonight's the 4th of July show. How is it that a cul-de-sac of just like 11 houses can put on a show like that? I don't know. I know, I used to do the same thing, but I've grown up. I'm not a child anymore. But Cheryl and I bought the little uh, kids' fireworks stuff, so we're doing the snappers and all that stuff. That's kind of fun. We'll be doing that tonight. But thank you, Lord, for the country that we have. It's Independence Day, and uh, um, we're going to speak out of Galatians. Go to Galatians 6 for a moment, and we're going to speak out of Two of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. We covered them a little bit last week. And I said, yes, we would be out of Galatians 5. But I want to just let us speak to you today on the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, the name of the message isn't fruit on the fourth or anything like that. I don't have that. I just thought of that. I thought, wow, that might be clever. No. But we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit this morning. And uh, two of the great verses to me in all of the Bible in Galatians chapter number 5 and, and looking at that. But we're going to go into Galatians 6 next week and then this, uh, this following Sunday. Hope, uh, hopefully some of you, many of you saw the email I sent out uh, for the weekend, sent it out on Friday evening that we will be having a VBSC celebration on Sunday, uh, July 18th, talking about all the things that God did. And, and I often use the phrase, a story of his glory and and just thanking the Lord for that. And so we'll be looking there. And then uh, the last Sunday of July, we'll finish out our series in Galatians, Free to Live Faith. It's been a great study. And to me, we can't go any further uh, to our study in chapter 6 unless we really look at those two verses deeply. We did, again, cover the, the works of the flesh that are manifest and the works of the Spirit that are manifest. But I really would like to spend a little time and say, well, I've heard about 10 messages or 20 on the Spirit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, and, and bless the Lord. Uh, but uh, may you come to the Word in our study this morning in a fresh way and seeing what God would have. Uh, the reason I had you go to Galatians 6 is look at the first verse there, and this will be next week's message. We'll cover the first, I believe I'm going to go down the first 10 verses of Galatians 6 next week. And the title of the message at this point, don't know, is going to be just simply one another. The phrase, love one another, bear one another's burdens, forgive one another, pray for one another. That is a theme, a common theme in the Bible. And it says in verse number one of chapter six, brethren, if a man be overcome, excuse me, overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now you think on that for a moment and say, okay, we're, we're going to get into that, yeah, next week. And think of all of the ramifications of what it means to bear one another's burdens. Someone that's overcome with a fault. And then, of course, it goes down even further to verse number 10 where we uh, have to have a, a priority in our lives to care for those of the household of faith. Now we go back to Galatians 5, verses number 22 and 23, and realize that the fruit of the Spirit is really going to be, it's going to be necessary, of course, but the fruit of the Spirit in the believer has to be quite strong to handle the idea that we're going to bear one another's burdens. We're going to do it in the spirit of meekness, which is part of the fruit of the spirit, of course. And, and then when you think, oh gosh, all of that in chapter 6 is 
we're tying this all together. Um, verse number 8 is very common. Uh, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall reap uh, of the Spirit, reap life everlasting, because verse number 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. To me, it behooves us spending a little time on what the fruit of the Spirit really means, how the fruit of the Spirit is so paramount in our lives when it comes to us saying, hey, I know the Holy Spirit of God, the Word of God is at work in my life, and I'm free to live faith, yes, but what's my condition when it comes to fruit bearing? What does the fruit look like in me? So that starts our first question of what does true fruit look like when it is produced from the true vine? What does it look like? Last week we used John 15, and we'll reference that here in a moment because it is so important for us to be reminded of what Jesus Christ told his disciples, and it's so important for us to know, of course, Paul teaching the believers, and it's always so important as we go into the Word of God to, to set some groundwork and say, okay, if we're really going to live this life that we're supposed to live in Jesus, and it's supposed to be a different life, it's supposed to be a, a life-changing life, yes, but a new life in Christ. Uh, it's supposed to be the uh, life that we now live in the flesh. We live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and loved you and loved us and gave his life for us. That it's not that you are going to live the crucified life like you can crucify yourself, but rather live the life that Jesus Christ crucified is what we attach ourselves to. And when we attach ourselves to Jesus Christ, then it is a crucified life. You don't have to crucify yourself. In fact, as we, we mentioned and even looking through that a few weeks ago and studying it, you can't, you can't crucify yourself. You can't put yourself on a cross. You can't. But we can, again, attach ourselves to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. The fruit of the Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does, what the Word of God does. And we constantly in this practical place go, what does true fruit look like when it's produced from the true vine? Do we just teach this to the children? Do we teach this just as a devotional ad? Do we just say, yeah, you're supposed to have love, joy, peace, long suffering, and gentleness, good? You're supposed to have that in your life, and you don't, then you're not really living for Jesus. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How does it happen? It happens with you and me just deciding, I'm going to stay with this. I'm going to be long-suffering. I'm going to be in a place where when the Lord inspects my life, he seals it. So what would his inspection reveal about us? Now I know the Bible teaches, and Jesus even, that hey, by their fruits you shall know them. And I've heard from old preachers, old pastors over the years of, hey, you know, you have to be a fruit inspector. Now, that can teeter on legalism. That can teeter on Pharisaicism, where I'm supposed to watch your life, and then I'm going to just constantly hound you on your fruit. So that's fine. You, you need to do that a bit. But, but let's just, and that, that's a biblical principle. Yes, we're supposed to check things out. You don't want to get in the midst of something with someone that's lost and someone who is not living with the Lord, and then maybe they, they, they take you down a road. And, and I get that, but... What would his inspection of me be like? What would God's inspection of the fruit in my life be like? Because we're supposed to submit ourselves to his inspection. And we're supposed to allow him as the fruit inspector. You see, fruit inspectors are everywhere. But God's fruit inspection of my walk it leads me back to, as I mentioned earlier, John 15, which again we referenced last week with that spirit life, that Holy Spirit filled life, that fruit life. So John 15, I've put the verses up there, verses 1 through 5. I am the true vine, Jesus says. Another one of his declarations of the I am statements, and my father is the husbandman. He continues, says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it might bring forth more fruit. The principle of fruit bearing, the principle of how Jesus Christ is laying out that my father is the husbandman, he's the overseer of the vineyard, that Jesus Christ is the true vine, he is the vine, and we are to produce fruit off of the fact that we are of the vine as his branches, we're to have fruit in our lives. We're to lead people to Jesus Christ. That's part of the fruit. 
but there's fruit of praise, as it says in Hebrews. There is, of course, fruit under good works. There's fruit for us in the Word of God, and we'll be studying that a bit because Jesus is teaching the principle of, now you're clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I should be sleeping in Jesus. I should be living in Jesus. I should cast out my tent and live right there with Jesus Christ. Oftentimes we look at a negative approach of our good walk with the Lord and say, okay, well, if I don't do that and I don't do that and I can do this, God says, wait a minute, there's a positive approach in your faith walk. If you live in me and walk in me and abide in me, there's going to be sweet fruit in your life. Because he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches that he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Jesus Christ could say that anywhere, anyhow, about any statement that he's ever made, any parable, any healing. Without me, you can do nothing. Without me, nothing. You can do nothing. And throughout the Old Testament, so many of the prophets, so many of the leaders attempted to do things without God. And of course, they did things. They just didn't do the thing that they were told to do, which means you can do nothing. That is fruit-bearing. That means anything for all of eternity without me. So, it goes to this statement. Very simply, as we looked at this last week, it's just kind of a, just kind of a, hey, wake up, just be reminded of what we covered in these last few verses in chapter number five. The fruit of the Spirit just, to me, crushes the works of the flesh. Just, it just crushes it. The, the fruit of the Spirit is the way to live. The works of the flesh, you know what? It crushes them, though, and it wins the battle when liberty in Christ is our faith walk catalyst. It's a different life. It's not the negative side if I don't, 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 don't. I've heard people say, I've said it myself, that after I got saved, I figured the only way that I could ever have a spirit-filled life, a godly life, was to just simply not do sin anymore. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that got that thought. Maybe it wasn't meant that way. But it comes down to us somehow, some way, reading the word of God through this filtration system that do not do that or else you'll be in trouble. Yes, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. God is putting the truth before you. And he's saying, hey, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. He's going through all those statements. He's saying, I'm just telling you, if you go down that pathway, it's not going to be good. But if you go down the pathway of the fruit of the Spirit, the Word of God, walking there, abiding in me, the fruit will come out of you. You have a liberty and freedom in Jesus Christ, right? To do that. And that's the faith walk catalyst that we should be living in. You say, well, that's just a little bit of a reminder. Yes, it is a more of a, okay, remember what we got. Our weapons are strong and they are spiritual because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's mostly the fruit of the Spirit that makes us be while we walk in faith to accomplish good works. You see, works are important too. I'm not saying they're not. It's just that we somehow choose one or the other when God's saying, hey, in my word I show you That works from your faith reveal your faith in Jesus Christ. They don't save you. The Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean work your works, do works for your salvation. It says work out your salvation with fear and trembling, which means your salvation, born again, now you work it out. Stretch it out a little bit. Let the Holy Spirit of God, because there will be works, but if our works, if our servanthood is just the works of the flesh, then where's the spiritual side of it? Works give us the do's, but the fruit of the Spirit gives us the be. And we're to be and to do, not exclusive of one or the other. You say, I know that, Pastor. This is basic walk with Jesus 101. Then how is it that the lost world doesn't respond How is it that the lost world is not interested? Yeah, it's on them, yes. But we are the ones that walk in the spirit of the living God. 
We are the ones that have the word of God. We are the ones that are born again, transformed, brand new creatures in Christ. We have the gospel mandate. We have received the power. We are to be witnesses. This is the mission of the church. And you know, many of you that have been talking to people and witness to people, there is an opportunity to lay before them spirit words, Holy Spirit words, the word of God, the truth, so that when you sanctify yourself, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Fruit of the Spirit with meekness and fear. It keeps on coming around. You and I somehow read over some Bible verses, and we say, I know that. It's almost like my grandchildren. Now, my four-year-old's pretty sharp. Grandpa, I know. She knows that already. It's remarkable. A little over four, I know, Grandpa. I know, Grandpa. i sorry, Maddie. Okay, go ahead. See, she's not my child, so I just say, go ahead. It's a good deal. Oh, as I've said to a few of you, huh, I wish I parented like a grandparent. Boy, I, man. You say, let everything go. Well, I, I don't know. The fruit of the Spirit would be a big help. But I know. I know. Sometimes we look at the fruit of the Spirit. I know all about that. It says in Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. We joked about it last week, but there is no laws written against being meek. There's no laws written in this world that you live in. There's nothing against you living faith. There's no law against you in the Bible that says you can't love other people. They're not going to put you in jail or arrest you for living the fruit of the Spirit out and being filled by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Fruit that is manufactured is in complete contrast to fruit that is manifested. Sit on that for a minute. When you manufacture something, you make it, you fabricate it from raw materials. You do it by hand. You have this ability with artistry or machinery, and you work it into what type of form you need that's convenient for use. You just mold, shape, do it, and you use your hands. The works of your hands is a beautiful thing. But fruit that's manufactured leaves out what God says I can do in manifesting myself, the fruit of the Spirit, in you through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a mega difference because the word manifest means to make visible or known what is hidden or unknown. People don't know what's going on inside in your heart and your soul and your spirit. They don't know and they're not supposed to look into you because that's God's job to look on your heart. But our attitudes, our, our actions, our, our words, our ways do manifest things. It says to manifest, whether by words or deeds or in any other way, to make something actual or visible. Fruit that is manufactured is complete contrast to fruit that is manifested. When God manifests his fruit in you by the Holy Spirit, you and I show that we are of the true vine. It's true vine, true fruit. True vine, true fruit. You say, well, that's really pretty simple. Yes, but are we of the true vine? Yes, we are. I'm born again. I'm saved. Okay, then what's the fruit like? Is it kind of true? Well, I need other people to inspect my fruit, and if they say I'm bad, then I'm done. No, 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 no. That, that, that's important, again, for people to be there and speaking to you and, and, and bearing one another's burdens. Yes, we'll, we'll look at the Word of God and what it's really teaching. But if that's singularly your thinking and perspective on how the fruit of the Spirit is going to work, then, again, there's a tendency in our flesh to go, I can fake this a little bit. I can mess with this a little bit. I can play around with this. You see, 
It's one thing to know clearly, and it's true, that the gift of the Spirit is salvation. The gift of the Spirit is salvation. But the gifts of the Spirit, of course, are spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. The fruit of the Spirit comes after the gift of the salvation. In Acts 2 and Acts 11, we're reminded of the gift of the Spirit and how that salvation came. And now, as we look at the fruit of the Spirit, we realize this. This list of stuff is big. You say, and the joke is, well, of the nine of them, I, I, I like a couple of them, and, and I like a few others. And a few. It's singularly spoken. Oh, I know you know that. But every one, every one of these is predicated in leaning on and evident with the others. Your love, your peace, your long-suffering, they may be bigger. The other fruit it's there, it just may be less right now. And God is saying, stay with it. God is saying, yes, the first three or four, my relationship with you and you with your relationship with me, so it's more of a up and down, God spirit type of thing, up and down, love, joy, peace. That's how you can see my relationship with you, God, love, joy, peace, and how you bring it down to me that the next three, of course, long suffering. And gentleness and, and goodness, those are about how you and I deal with other people. And then, of course, the last three about how I deal with myself, looking at myself. So what I want to do, just for the few minutes, just kind of highlight some things. If you, you want, I'm going to mention a bunch of Bible verses just from my notes. I didn't put a bunch of them down. Some of you that take notes or not, that's okay. I'll give you the addresses of some of this. I had quite a study of different things, but... But I didn't want to bog this down. I just want to hit all nine of these, take a minute or two on each one of them, and see how this thing unfolds for the love, the joy, the fruit of the Spirit. The first one is, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. You say, I get that. Okay, but how do you see love? Did a wedding last Sunday and I saw a beautiful young couple uh, go off and they're, they're married and, and uh, it's a beautiful thing and and they're two young people, and they love each other. But the part about spending time with them is to say, do you, do you really capture, as we all have to capture over time, how much God loved you, how much God loves you? I know he loves me, and it's, it's not a matter of love as a component that just shows you how to love other people. It's deeper than that. This type of love is not just that. It's God would love others through you. And it's God's love of sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's God showing love, Jesus showing love by suffering. You see, the love that you and I really think is the kind of love that God's really talking about. It's not the love of 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, which is talking about charity endureth long, charity suffereth, charity doesn't envy itself, it doesn't puff itself up. Love is a component of the fruit of the Spirit, is that which is produced by your walk with Jesus Christ. Biblical love is not possible unless it originates from God's love, where he sent his only begotten son. As it says in 1 John chapter number 4, verse 10, he sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 30, husbands are supposed to relate to that as Jesus did for the church and laid down his life. The Bible says that no man ever loved his own flesh, excuse me, hated his own flesh. We're to put our flesh down. God says, hey, your walk with Jesus Christ will reveal to you the love that I want to show through you. Then there's joy. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Joy, the incredible power of joy in the Lord, that's determined not by circumstances, but by definites and by truth. How do you get that joy? If you don't mind, Art, I saw the joy upon your face Sunday right here when you called out to the Lord to save you. Joy was upon you. You looked like you had joy. Joy. The joy came from that love of God sending his son and calling on the name of the Lord to save. I remember the joy that just flooded my soul when Jesus Christ saved my soul. I remember the joy that I had for the first time truly in my life. I had a lot of happiness. Things would come and go. But that joy is a deep abiding type of joy by walking with Jesus Christ in his liberty. Sufficient grace brings joy. 
The Bible says in Hebrews 12 that Christ endured the cross with joy. Nehemiah 8.10 says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Even in John chapter number 15, when you look at that, hitherto you have asked nothing in my name, asking you receive that your joy may be full. Jesus is saying, look, in me you'll find the joy that you're looking for, that incredible power of joy. Have you ever watched and looked and seen someone that has the fruit of the Spirit, joy? Gosh, they're so enjoyable and sweet. They, 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 be around, they lift you. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. I was around two people for a couple of days by the name of Gorn and Gina Hunyak. You saw them out at the camp. My gosh. On May 18th, she had surgery to remove cancer from her brain. And she's out there at the camps. Just Gina. <laughs> holding her grandbaby saying, oh my. The Lord would give me more time on this earth. I got babies I want to take care of. She's a grandma. She's got number nine and ten coming. Oh my. And Gorn and Gina are filled with the joy of the Lord. It's sweet. And then they have the peace of the Lord. They have this peace, complete peace, they said. Peace, they said, is through the blood of Jesus Christ. We knew that from the moment that we get saved. And now we live in that peace in Colossians 1.20. The peace with God through faith. Romans 5.1. You now are at peace, Art. Praise the Lord. Every one of you that ever called in the name of the Lord to save you, you understand that now you're at peace with God. There's no more War with God. It says in Philippians 4, you know the peace of God that passes all understanding. Jesus Christ said in John 14, 27, that, hey, this peace that I give you is unlike the world's peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 14, 27, you say, okay, I know all that stuff. Then do a little bit of a study and then have God inspect your fruit and say, Gosh, what happened to my joy? What happened to the peace? What happened to the love that I had? And then he goes into the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. What our daily Christian life and experience needs for this life. Long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness as we look at next. Some say that long-suffering is this ability to endure with courage. Persistence. You stay with it, that stick to itiveness. When it's from the Spirit, it never stops. When the fruit of the Spirit is real, you never stop. You keep on having that suffering, long thinking process. You are persistent in the Lord. First Timothy tells us it is God's nature to be long suffering. First Timothy 1. Romans 2 and 2 Peter 3 9 talk about how God's long suffering leads to repentance. You know that. Colossians 3 12 through 17. You put on. After putting off the old man, you put on the new man of Jesus Christ, those new garments. And you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And there's this long-suffering heart in you. You keep after it, and you never quit. James 5, verses 7 through 11, tell us that we are to go through this suffering affliction. It's like a, a longer, a long patience. We are to suffer long. We think, okay, is that the way it's supposed to be? This is the fruit of the Spirit. Well, I don't like those. I don't like a couple of those. Really? Well, they're in you. You can't get rid of them. Uh, 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 uh. And the Holy Spirit's not like that. That's the brownie. Uh, uh, uh. He's saying, I want to have more. I want to allow, have you allow me to dwell in you more. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. What does it mean to be gentle? Some people say that's a gentle man. That's a gentle woman. That person has a gentleness about them. They have a demeanor and their behavior is, has, is, has dignity. They have style. They have an elegance about them that's not of themselves but something heavenly. There should never ever be, there's not a need ever, to act like a foolish person or a jerk toward others. That's, that's not something that we need to do. And each one of us knows that in that place, Paul the Apostle taught as Jesus taught about this gentleness. And Paul says, this quality of the Lord Jesus Christ, gentleness, I tap into. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... 
who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. He's saying, look, I am only confident in him, in me. But it's firm and properly confident. David said in Psalm 18, God's gentleness made me great. Look it up. Psalm 18, verses 30 through 35. God's gentleness made David great. We all want to be great. What does the Spirit of God tell us? Gentleness is really big to the Lord. And then there's goodness. What does it mean to see a good person? We know the old phrase, there's nothing good in us. But that moral character transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ shows goodness to people. There's goodness that comes from you to people. And people see the goodness of the Lord in you. And they're so thankful to be treated well. They're, they're just be good to people. Oh, people say that as a catchphrase. Well, be good to people. The goodness of God is different. It's the Spirit of God. The Bible verse that's up on the banner from the Acts 1A conference. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. But a faithful man who can find? Because the faithful man doesn't talk about themselves and their goodness. The steps of a good Lord or a good man are ordered by the Lord. That goodness, Psalm 144 says, my goodness is Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 8 through 10 shows that goodness comes from a walk in the light of God. It's again back to this moral character. There's none good but God, it says in Mark chapter number 10. There's none good but God. Mark 10, verses 17 through 18. And then faith. The last three. Faith. Meekness and temperance. Faith, of course. How many times does faith show up in the Bible? The Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is faith. It appears in all of its forms over 300 times in the Bible. Over 300 times. From the salvation faith to the trial-like faith, the fruit faith that's in you, Others need to see it. In fact, your faith can be such an incredible encouragement to people. It really can. The fruit of the Spirit, faith, might take someone else through when they see that it's really God faith, that's Holy Spirit faith. It's what we need to have more of by Him. The Holy Spirit pushing down into us, indwelling in a deeper way, saying here, the fruit of the Spirit is faith. Complete dependence on God. Galatians 2.20, our theme verse for the series. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You can't get enough of this stuff. You memorize these Bible verses, you have them on your heart, which then feeds the strength and the goodness of the Holy Spirit of God within you to be more. You trust in God's word. You have a trustworthy character because you trust more. It inspires others. Peter, Peter was all about his opinions. And in spite of what God said, you are being faithless. And now he confronts him on the beach. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And now his faith is completely co confronted by the Lord. And of course he's about to be one of those spirit-filled apostles on the day of Pentecost, and he'll understand the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is meekness, the last couple, and temperance. I tie these together and just make a couple of practical, real-life applications for all of this fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is just a simple, uh, simple study. Meekness, this is just an overview for just a few minutes we know the old phrase, meekness is not weakness. The go-to phrase is, meekness is power under control. Think of these two or three different people. It says in Numbers 12 that Moses was meek. Was he a sissy? No. Was he strong? Yes. The Bible teaches very clearly in reference to him. I am meek and lowly. Jesus Christ said that of himself. Moses was very meek. He said that. It's spoken of as him being meek. 
You think of Peter as well, of being of meek and quiet spirit. Peter, Jesus, Moses, my goodness. Those were not weak men in the word of God. I wonder sometimes about the fruit of the spirit being canceled and quenched in all of us and so that our brothers and sisters don't have a chance to partake in the things that you really desire. You desire this closeness of brothers and sisters in the Lord, that friendship in the Spirit, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, and I do as well. That's where we match up. It's God in us. And lastly, the fruit of the Spirit is temperance. People would say that's simply self-control. But as I've heard and read some things that Somebody said it's God control, not self-control, but God control, that you and I submit ourselves to allowing God to control. Temperance is always sitting there. Well, I have a terrible temper problem. Welcome to the team. People say, you don't know how bad my temper is. Well, I'm sure we all have a little bit of a temper problem, especially when things don't go the way we plan. You say, does that mean that I'm lost and I don't have the fruit of the Spirit in me? No, it means that you have a flesh and the fruit of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh are constantly battled as a born-again believer. I love that, though, because that proves to me that when God has control over my spirit, it is the Holy Spirit. There's temperance that we're supposed to have in a race, as it says in 1 Corinthians 9, that we're to do all things in moderation, Paul says in Philippians 4. That's really powerful. You see, true vine, true fruit is really what people want to experience in your life and they want to have it in their life. You say, okay, well all that and saying all those Bible verses and I didn't get all those, and well, let's just pull it all together then. I got three little references and and three powerful, simple references, I believe, that just, that really kind of support this whole nine piece of the fruit of the Spirit in a way that you and I, when we walk into Galatians 6, we go, bear one another's burdens? For a man think himself to be something, he's nothing, he deceives himself? For he that soweth to the flesh... Reap flesh, reap corruption? I mean, how do we do this? How how is this? You be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law, the works of the flesh are the manifest. Paul's constantly going back and forth and he's driving me crazy. No, he's not. He's laying it down for your life, my life, and every one of us to know that when we are truly in the Word and spending time with Him in in a neat way, the fruit of the Spirit manifests itself in us and we don't have to announce to everybody how good we are. Here's the first practical thought as we, again, just spend a couple of minutes that maybe these will just really connect with you. First one, true fruit from the true true vine is manifested, made known from somewhere that someone can see, but made known words, actions, manifested from the proper environment, filled with walking in the spirit and the word. What's the proper environment? Part of it is today. In your home, that's part of it. Spending time with other people away from your home, what's the proper environment with brothers and sisters in the Lord? What about your proper environment as you go to work? Have you prepared? Have you spent time with the Word Spend time walking in the Spirit of God. Because very simply, we know the battle that existed before we were saved was a semi-battle of how much trouble am I going to get into. Or as a little kid, you say, well, I got saved at a young age. We still know that we didn't really know righteousness until salvation. Romans chapter number 6, verses number 20 through 23. You can go there. I am going to read them. I put up there Romans 6, verses 20 through 23. One of the verses will be highlighted in a minute, but let me just read verses 20 through 23. It says simply this, For when we were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. When you're lost, five years old, eight years old, 
Don't know righteousness. Do you remember that? No, I don't remember that. I remember before I got saved that I did whatever I felt like doing, and I didn't know right from wrong. Yes, I did, only when my mom and dad told me. Get a little bit older, and you flee righteousness because you're free from living it. Verse 21, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof you're now ashamed? For the thing, end of these things is death. You, you, oh man, what things that you did when you were lost as you got older. Now you, those things, you're now ashamed of them because you're born again. You're going, I, I, didn't, I can't believe I did those things. And then verse 22 comes. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sometimes we trap ourselves. We forget about the liberty in Christ. We're free to serve and to live. We're free to be and to do. Because Jesus has said, you are no longer bound and entangled by the yoke of bondage of your sin. Which was the fact that, hey, you were free from righteousness when you're lost but now you're free from the sin now that you're saved the unrighteousness ye have your fruit unto holiness in the end everlasting life i don't feel very hell, uh, holy true fruit from the true vine is manifested from the proper environment filled with walking in the spirit and the word that's how that happens. The next one. I messed with you a little bit, didn't I? Up there, yeah? You're good, though. Thank you, B. The next one is this. True fruit from the true vine is manifested in real relationships. Not fake, re real ones. You all want those kind? Based upon walking with others in the Holy Spirit. There's something neat about that. There's something neat about... And I see Randy there, I'm thinking, in just in a few weeks, he's going to take a few people in a foreign land. He's going to go to Honduras. Does it have to be like that? No, but it's an example of how the true fruit from the true vine is manifested in real relationships based upon walking with others in the Holy Spirit. You're going to be praying for one another, giving the gospel. You're going to be studying the word of God, getting devotions and time and the word of God personally. And there's something about walking with others in the Holy Spirit that does something about your fruit. We need that. We like to give a terminology that is general but then specific in life to be involved in some type of disciple-making relationship, some form of discipleship. Some form of fellowship. Now, ship is not the end of everything, but it could go that way. We could say this is worship. Oh, so we're just supposed to get in a ship. That wasn't very funny at all. Now, listen, listen. You and I just kind of categorize things in the way that we think they ought to go. So then we have this works of the flesh idea. The Holy Spirit is saying, I want to just work in your life by the word of God. I'm the teacher. I'm the comforter. I'm the convictor. I'm the one that's going to reprove you and work you. It says up on the screen there in the next passage, Ephesians 5. And I mentioned this in, 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 earlier about this passage, but Ephesians 5 is a good one. When it talks about, again, the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Verse number 8, Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness. Remember when you were lost? This is the comparative of being lost and now saved. But now you're, you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. It's up there. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. What's acceptable unto the Lord. Walk as children of light. And the Spirit is all goodness and righteousness and truth. Wow. That's a good life. In the midst of the suffering, the craziness, and everything you're going to go through, that's the life. But you're free to do it. You're free. Who bewitched you? Who entangled you? Don't fall in that trouble. You and I don't have to rehearse and bring before each other a list of everyone that knows what it's like to walk in our flesh versus walk in the Spirit. We all know our own testimony. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. You see, the fruit of the Spirit goes back to 
being filled with the fruits of righteousness, as it says in Philippians chapter number one. And then lastly, true fruit from the true vine, here's where it lands, is manifested by heavenly living. You know, the fun phrase is just a little slice of heaven. It's manifested by heavenly living, forming the character of God in the spirit-filled believer. Now leave that up there for a minute. I want you to go to James 3. We're going to end here. I want you to, want you to see where this comes from because it comes from the word of God. All of this comes, of course, from the word of God. It's meaningless unless the basis is the word of God. It's just Romans 6 is clear. Ephesians 5 is clear. The comparison of both. When you were lost, you didn't have any clue of righteousness. Then you get saved. Whoa! The things that you used to do, now you do them, you're ashamed of them. And then, of course, Ephesians talks about being in the light, the children of light, but you were in darkness before. The Spirit of the living God says, I bring you fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That's the fruit. You say, well, that's good for a children's ministry study. Well, we're supposed to be children of light. And since we always want to be so mature in the room, the Father still wants us to come to him as children. And it says in James chapter number 3, something very, very strong and powerful in reference to that statement that's up there, that the true fruit from the true vine is manifested by heavenly living, forming the character of God in us. The spirit-filled believer. James 3. Again, we pick it up in verse number 13. It says this. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out good conversation, his manner of walk, his behavior, his works with meekness of wisdom. Hmm. You're so smart. You're so. But who among you is so smart and has knowledge? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Not bragging on themselves. Not puffing themselves up. Verse 14 says, But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. That's what cancels the Holy Spirit out. Verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. People of this lost world do not need to be confused by us. It should be crystal clear who we are. Not by you manifesting some little do-goody thing or a work of the flesh that they can see a surfacey act, but rather the fruit of the Spirit actually welling up inside of you so that when you speak, when you act, when you talk, when you're added to, you go, wow, you are bothering me, but you're bothering me for the right reason, which is the fruits of righteousness which are in your life, the fruit of the Spirit's in your life, being fruitful into every good work, as it says in Colossians. And he continues with the verse I have up on the screen, verse number 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. I accept and listen to that. I entreat your words because the wisdom that's from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy. And good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Whew, that's convicting. And verse number 18 puts a cap around it all. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Whew. The fruit of the Spirit. Simple Bible lesson this morning. But yet... From the word of God, it still is so profound and so right for each one of us. It leads us to a question to finish in our time of invitation and prayer. This is our challenge, church. 
with each week of our series? Are we manufacturing works stuck in the works of the flesh, whitewashing some things, and, but are we manifesting or are we manifesting the Spirit? That's what I want in my own life. I want more of that. Manifesting the works of my flesh. I love serving the Lord. That can be a good thing and a difficult thing for every one of us. We're going to have a thank you picnic next Saturday to thank all those that serve in the Lord in this church that undergird. They kind of do things in the, in the quiet. They don't even want attention to be made. They manifest the fruit of the Spirit in some of the things that they just do because of their heart, their attitude, their words, their actions, their love for others, their prayer. It manifests the fruit. That's what we have in the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit. When it's manifested and not manufactured, wow. People see that, believe in that, and love to know, hey, what can that do in my life? Well, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. You need salvation. Let's start with love. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we look at that question in our time of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you with a simple but yet needful request that you speak to every one of us, your church, in this moment as much as you have through the singing, through the prayer, through the time of, of even just going through your word that it would be specific and pointed for my heart and everybody's heart as only you can do. May the Spirit of God and the fruit of the Spirit within us be something that is manifest because we love the Word of God, we love the Lord Jesus Christ, and we walk in the Spirit because we live in the Spirit. I pray for this time of prayer, invitation, time for us just to, to do a little bit something with what we've heard because our hearts need that. It's not a matter of our flesh. It's a matter of you and our hearts. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Please stand.